Hey guys, this is Mike Tarallo with Click, and in this video, I'm continuing to make you familiar with Click GeoAnalytics by introducing the operator in the Click GeoAnalytics connector known as Spatial Index. So I'd like you to bear with me in this video. It's going to be a little bit longer than usual because there's a lot of steps and some prerequisite information that you should follow when setting up the Spatial Index because I want to show you how it all fits together. Okay, so to get started, I have a completed example, and we're going to pick up where we left off with the bin layer, but I modified this example slightly to show you how we're going to work with the spatial index. To make a long story short, the spatial index basically creates an imaginary boundary or grid layer on top of your existing data points of locations, and then when used with the uh, visible selection option within the map layer, it automatically selects within your viewing area those points. And you can see due to the associative nature of the click associative engine, the other charts are actually updating as I continue to zoom in. And you can see the number of reports and locations are starting to reduce. Now, as I keep going in, I have some thresholds that I've set for the visibility. And what we can see is that we went from the hexagonal bin layer now to the individual location points that are representing the different crimes that occurred in the Chicago area. And then I also have some color persistency set up. So if I just wanted to see all thefts, I select theft and all of the red triangles now show me theft. If I also select, let's say, uh, assault, now we can see the comparison of theft and assault. So we're going to build this. It is going to take a little bit longer than the quicker five minute videos, etc. Uh, do understand this is the fourth video in the series, so I'll make sure you have the other prerequisite videos as well so you can kind of build up this example, and I will include this sample as well. So let's get started building this. So to get started, I actually have a template of where we left off when we finished the binning example. And here we go. Okay, so we have, just to recap, a bar chart, a KPI object, and the Click Geo Analytics map with the Click Geo Analytics area layer. And what we've done is we used the binning operator to take all of the crime stats at the various locations and plot those, and then use color by measure to denote the higher threshold of crimes that occurred in that particular area. So what we'd like to do is be able to now to zoom into this, and as we're zooming, we're going to see the selections reduce in the visible area, and then we're also going to see the available data points. But in order to do that, we need to create a point layer that has all of our locations. So I'm going to go into edit mode. I'm going to go to my custom objects. And then here I'm going to select the bubble layer. Now, just to recap, understanding I am using the Click GeoAnalytics extensions. Uh, because we're using the Click GeoAnalytics connector as well when we do the spatial index and the binning operation. These particular layers are not yet available, or operations are not yet available in our native default map. Okay, so for our bubble layer, we're going to just associate our unique ID. In this case, we had the ID of the crime, and it's actually just the ID field. And then for the location, we're going to click Add Measure, and that is going to be our longitude and latitude point that was generated. And here it forces us to choose an aggregation, but here we can just remove the aggregation. Uh, best practice might be to use the function only. And now you can see all of the points related to those IDs. You can see the points layer is overlapping our bin layer. So we have to make a couple adjustments here. So before we make those visibility or hide or show adjustments, let's make some adjustments to the shape, size, and color, and then also relate them to the bar chart. So within the bubble layer, I'm going to go to Appearance, Shape and Size, and let's represent them as triangles. I'll adjust the min and max radius. Then we'll go to Colors, turn off Auto Colors, and here we're going to color by dimension. And then for the dimension, we're going to use the crime type. So you can see here from the drop down list, I could then type in primary type, and that's the field for the crime type. 
And in this case here, there's more than 12 colors, so we can choose the 100 color scheme. And you can create your own. I'm not going to go into that. That's beyond the scope of this particular video. And then I'm going to check persistent colors. Now we're going to do the same thing for the crime type bar chart. So I go to crime type bar chart. We're going to go to colors and legend. Turn off auto colors. Change this to by dimension. And you can see it already defaults to primary type. Choose our 100 colors and then persistent colors. Okay, so by checking persistent colors and setting the same color scheme for both charts, when we perform our selections on these charts, the color will associate and represent the same crime type on the map as, as the selection on the bar chart. Okay, so we set up our persistent colors between the two charts. Now we have to work on the visibility of these particular points. So for the first layer, which is our bin layer, we want this to display when we have greater than 10,000 points. So in other words, we want the bin layer to always display on top until we zoom in to the under layer, which is going to be the individual triangles or locations. So under layer options, maximum number of objects we're going to, to display. Now, in other words, these are the number of location points that are going to be represented underneath these bins, so to speak. So that's going to be 10,000. And this is another best practice that you can use. Now, calculation condition is kind of like the hide and show condition. So for this particular threshold, we're going to use a function, count distinct, and then the name of the individual data points, in this case our IDs. And we're going to make sure that these are greater than and equal to 10,000. So as long as it meets this particular threshold when we're selecting or zooming in, it's always going to display the bin layer. When it goes below that threshold, then it's going to display the bubble layer. So that being said, we now have to go to our bubble layer we have to also change our hide show condition. So maximum number of objects here will be 10,000. In this case, we use the same function, count distinct ID. And this time, it's going to be less than 10,000. So when we get less than 10,000 points, then display the individual triangles. So right here, now, we're not introducing spatial index yet, we're just introducing the fact that as we continue to zoom at certain zoom levels, depending on when the number of points are selected, it's either going to hide or show those individual points. Now, being that we haven't performed any of those selections as we're zooming, it's still showing us the bin layer. But for example, if I was to just select, let's say, uh, robbery, and yeah, let's just use robbery. So it's at 6,000, um, 685, you can see that the hexagonal layer disappeared, and now we see the 6,000 triangle points for robbery. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to be able to use our visible area, so when we pan and when we zoom, it's going to reduce the selection like I showed you in the opening example. And we do that with the spatial index operator. So to get to that spatial index operator, we go to our data load editor, and this is going to be very similar to what we did in the other examples, using the click geoanalytics connector, selecting an operation, and then putting in some parameters. So just to recap, I'm bringing in this crime data, and in the opening video I did show where you can get this data available uh, publicly. Uh, for those of you who might want to see that again, you can see that there is the Crimes 2018 City of Chicago data set that is available here publicly on the website that you can download as well. Okay. But to get back to that, you can see we have an alias. That is our table that has all our crime data in it. So I'm going to copy that table alias. And there's the ID field. And then we automatically created this longitude and latitude, which is the geometry point or the coordinate. So those are the fields I'm going to need. So I'm going to create a new tab. Call this spatial index. I'm going to put it after the binning. And then I just do this for notes purposes. That is the alias. Then we're going to need the longitude underscore latitude field geometry point. And then we also need the ID field. OK, 
Okay, so these are just notes for me to allow you to see the parameters we're going to fill in. Then I go to my GeoAnalytics connector and click Select Data. My operation this time is going to be Spatial Index. And as I mentioned, this creates a number of indice tables that when working with the map settings creates this imaginary layer uh, grid or boundaries that you define the radius of those boundaries uh, also in degrees. And there's a special formula that you need to understand when doing this. Um, you could go to a couple of websites that talk about this type of under, um, formula. I actually have it, I think, right here. How big is a degree of latitude and longitude? And it talks about one degree of latitude, one minute of latitude, etc. Because, you know, the Earth is not a perfect sphere, right? It's uh, wider around the middle and narrow at the top. Um, I'm not going to pretend I understand all of uh, this information. But for example, I know one degree is about 69 miles. So 0.1 degrees is 6.9 miles. 0 0.001 is 0 0.069 miles. Basically, when you define these parameters for the operations, you're defining the like the height and the width of these grids and the number of grids that are going to be available to perform the selection of those underlying points. So these are the ones that are used by default. But this also depends on the density of your data, right? So if you're looking at, let's say, earthquakes, which are stretched out across the world, you might want to have your grid sizes a lot bigger. Since I'm actually just focusing in on the Chicago area and the density in that smaller area, I might want my grid size or, or boundary size to be a little bit smaller. So for my instance here, 0 0.001 actually worked better. Now you could play around with these parameters, uh, but basically think of this as the height and the width of those invisible boundaries that are going to be selecting the points when you zoom in. A name data set can stay default. The type, it's from the loaded table. So in other words, our previously loaded data. Uh, and if we remember, that was called crimes underscore dash underscore 2018. The tables and fields that we're going to use for this are ID field, as well as our geometry, in this case, which was longitude underscore latitude. Okay, once again, understanding we automatically created that point. We took the latitude and the longitude fields, combined them into a geometry point, which is this type here. And then that's all we need at this point. And then we click Next. And then click Insert Script. And you can see here are some of those parameters for grid height and grid width. You could actually go in and make these modifications. Another rule of thumb is you technically can delete all of this if you wish and then click on the connector once again, and you can see your settings will be maintained. But once you leave the data load editor, these settings will be reset. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so now we're gonna load the spatial index. Now I want you to keep note of what happens here when the data gets loaded. We're loading in our crime stats data, we're loading in the data for the binning, and then you're gonna see we're loading in the data for the spatial index, and it creates these index tables. Okay, now I remember Earlier I said that there are some operational parameters that you could adjust. You can see it's creating six separate indice tables. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, now at this point, this is where all the information lies for this uh, grid that's going to be able to zoom in when we use the scroll of our mouse, for example. Now if you want to see this in more detail, you could go to the data model viewer And then you can see these indice tables that have been created. You could select the indice table, and then you can see the underlying selections. Now, this information works with the map component. I'm not going to pretend I know exactly how it works, but this basically is underlining the boundaries that are going to be used. So now that's all loaded, we go back to our map layer, go into edit mode, click on our map object, go to map settings, and there's two things I want to show you. If you ever want to default to the existing layer, so when you come back to your app, that layer is showing you that particular zoom setting, you could unselect zoom to selection and then click save current view. And what that will do is write some information so every time you come back to this app, it always will stay at that zoom level. So now we check zoom to selection, auto select visible. That is the key to working with the spatial index right there. And then we click done. 
And then watch what happens as I use my scroll wheel on my mouse and I start to zoom in. You're going to see the number of reports are starting to change. I can now zoom and pan. And based off of the viewable area, the number of objects are going to increase or decrease depending on those objects within that area. Now I'm going to continue to zoom. We're at 24,000, 13,000. Remember, we had 24,000 incidents, 13,000 distinct locations at this point. So in other words, there are some overlap for some of these crimes that occurred in the same location. Zoom in a little bit more, and now you can see we're at 2,653 crimes at 1,545 locations. And then once again, the zooming and panning is either reducing or increasing the number of crimes. Now, if I wanted to do, let's say, a, a comparison, a nice example uh, that Patrick Nostrum had uh, shared with me would be basically, let's say, if you wanted to do comparison of crimes within a particular area that you might be familiar with. Um, if you can't see, for example, some of the underlining map, see how everything is covered, like I'm looking for the O'Hare Airport, you can change the opacity. So you can select your layer and then look for your transparency setting. And then you can see the underlining labels within the map. And then you can do that for your point layer as well. So a nice little example that was shared with me by one of my colleagues was to compare the types of crimes that occurred near the O'Hare Airport. So you could see here on the map in this particular area here, we could look at the different types of crimes and maybe we could compare theft with assault, for example, or motor vehicle theft to see if there's any thefts near the airport. And you can see it's actually not if not any motor vehicle theft, actually one motor vehicle theft reported at the, uh, or 30 of them reported um, in this particular location. Okay, so here's another perfect example of that. Um, looking at this viewable area. Okay, so selecting motor vehicle theft, 27 incidents. And then within seven locations, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then the surrounding area. It's actually better viewed um, looking at the maximum area here. Okay, but at this point you get the understanding of how the spatial index works and how the select visible works. Okay, so as I mentioned, a little bit longer but definitely some valuable information in here to help you make more advanced uh, click geoanalytics types of analysis. If you have any questions, uh, of course, uh, leave them in the comments where this video is posted, whether it's in YouTube or the Click community. And don't forget to check out these other great resources to learn more about Click and ClickSense, as well as Click Geoanalytics. Definitely want to hear from you, so speak up and let me know what you think. All right, guys, hope this was helpful. Take care, and I'll see you on the next video.